Good morning, everybody. We're going to pick up exactly what uh, Richard said a few minutes ago. What is coming next? And that's the challenge, particularly for finance ministers and those uh, who are right at the peak, right at the top. And while the chairs are being uh, moved on for our three guests, um, we want to shape your thinking based on the kind of things we heard yesterday. Let's build forward from that. Is it enough, as Minister Georgiadis said yesterday, humans are smart people. We will survive. Is that what's going to happen in macrofinance? In macro we want to put the pulse on global macrofinance for the next 30 minutes. Remember what Governor uh, Rumayan said yesterday. Uh, we have to learn how to manage crises not be managed by crises. So where are we now? What are we facing? What are the variables that are coming down the track? Can we identify? Are they unpalatable? Are they unthinkables? Are they clear on the radar screens of all of you gathered here? And as we heard from Mubadala yesterday, we must step back and reset the issues. So that's what we want to do. Let me invite our guests up onto the, uh, the platform, please. Steve Mnuchin, who is joining us. Four years as Treasury Secretary until last year. Steve, welcome. His Excellency Sheikh Salman uh, bin Khalifa, Minister of Finance and National Economy for the state of Bahrain, welcome. And uh, the Minister of Finance for Saudi Arabia, His Excellency Mohammed Al Jadan, welcome to all three of you. So we want to get this as a conversation, a conversation which gets to the heart of the things which are so difficult to identify uh, at the moment. We heard from David Solomon yesterday, economic realities are now going to tighten. We heard as well from Jamie Diamond yesterday, in six months, we're going to be hit, as he put it. So let me pick up immediately uh, with uh, the finance minister for the K Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, uh, Minister, Yesterday, we heard from your Minister for Investment. We must adjust for prolonged lower growth. What are you taking away? and What are you planning for? What do you see coming? Is it about pessimism? Is it about optimism? Is it about realism? Thank you very much. And it's good to be here again. And thank you, everyone, for being with us. I think there are... Um, multiple ways of looking at this, but I'll, I'll try to be as brief as I can. Um, the world is not one, um, you cannot look at the world in one way. Uh, there are multiple ways you look at it, and there are multiple regions, um, and there are also interconnectedness. Um, and we saw that very clearly from the data yesterday. Indeed, indeed, and we have seen how the world is almost split into optimistic side that are, you know, looking for the future, those who plan, those who are able to make long-term decisions um, and prepare themselves for difficult times uh, are reaping the benefits. Um, those who um, haven't uh, are fa facing difficult time. And I can tell you, um, the world is going through a very, very difficult time in general. How are you adjusting the mindsets in your ministry? I, th I think what we need to do is encourage cooperation and collaboration. I think the world needs stability, needs predictability for macrofinance to be available, for investment to be available. And that is becoming very difficult with all the shocks that we have seen, with all the difficulties, with all the disruption, with interest rate increasing, inflation, cre inflation increasing. Um, and, you know, a lot of countries going through a very difficult time when it comes to debt um, distress. These are very difficult situations, but at the same time, the world needs to talk. And we are working with international organizations within the G20 and others to try and help. And, this, and I can tell you within the region, what Saudi Arabia did is we mobilized the regional multilateral development institutions to make sure that we provide support to countries in the region but we are also doing our part, and we worked with the Indonesian presidency in the G20 to provide some support to the world at large, but also to the low-income countries and emerging markets when it comes to energy and food. Um, we are providing support bilaterally, 
Uh, and we are making sure that we stay the course. We have a vision that we started a few years ago. We prepared ourselves and we are reaping the benefit uh, but, when it comes to economic growth. Let me ask you though, very precisely, how do you see things in the next six to nine months? Not six to nine years, six to nine months. Look where we were six to nine months ago. We didn't have a war. We didn't have many of the things which are now happening. Have you a precision, a clarity of what is coming? Yes, I think I can tell you it's very difficult to predict what is going to come, what's, what's coming to the world. But I can tell you worldwide, I think it is going to be a very difficult six months. Regional, I think the region is, is largely split into two <coughs> sectors or two areas. One is the Gulf region. I think the next six months and possibly the next six years are going to be actually very good. The wider region is going to be very difficult, and it's our role to help that wider region. Worldwide, I think we need to work to ensure that there is more collaboration, cooperation, to bring about stability, and that's what we are doing. Right, well, let me move on, because uh, Sheikh Salman, welcome. And uh, Steve and you were reminding us, just before we came on the platform, that this time last year, you were warning about inflation. Now, what's your assessment building on what we've just heard uh, from the KSA? Thank you very much, Nick. It's a pleasure to be here uh, in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and back at the FII, uh, and wonderful to be on this panel with two uh, good friends. Uh, there are certainly a multitude of challenges that the world faces, as His Excellency, the Minister of Finance, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia mentioned, uh, and inflation is certainly one of them, driven by the disruption in supply chains coming out of COVID, compounded by the conflict in Europe. Uh, and now it is, it is a, a period where there is food price inflation, energy price inflation, uh, and, and that is a, a big issue. One of the positive aspects that we're seeing very recently is that shipping costs are coming down. And last year, when Stephen and I were uh, up here on the stage, uh, we did say that the world was taking a very sanguine view on inflation. Not a lot of people were talking about it, and the writing was on the wall. And then that was further compounded by uh, the geopolitical tensions. Now we're beginning to see uh, portions of it abate, but it will be extremely important to focus on supply chains. And supply chains will play a critical role. We saw in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, His Royal Highness, the Crown Prince, launch uh, the uh, Global Supply Chain Resilience Initiative, and it will be extremely important for countries all over the world to participate and make sure that domestically within country, within their own regions, they are really building resilience in the supply chain. But let chains. me press you, where do you see, we've just heard it's going to be a very difficult six months at least. We had a very gloomy World Bank IMF meeting a couple of weeks ago in Washington. Where, where do you see things happening? What is everyone in this room? What are those watching online? What are the vast numbers of people who are deeply frightened, many of them, by what is coming, about how they have to prepare and equip themselves for what is coming down the track? The danger, of course, is we're beginning to see economic activity slow down in many parts of the world at a time where our inflation is very high. Uh, and to ensure that we weather, <laughs> and uh, it is uh, further compounded by the fact that a lot of countries have limited fiscal space coming out of COVID. COVID battered the ships, battered the sails, and then we're sailing into another storm. Uh, and that is what people need to be prepared for. And the slowdown in economic activity, while inflation is still high, together will be a big challenge in many parts of the world. Right, well, let me leave, move, move to Steve Mnuchin. Steve, um, uh, you, of course, created and saved a bank uh, in the last financial crisis. Um, when you look at what is happening and you look at what Lord Mervyn King, former governor of the Bank of England, said a couple of days ago, this is going to be much worse. He said, people have got to prepare themselves. Is that the kind of framing you have in your mind? Um, I think a year ago, people underestimated the risks. And my own view is we're now overestimating those risks. So all of a sudden, everybody has turned in incredibly negative. But isn't it better to at least have them on, the, on, on a sheet somewhere? Of, of, of course it is. But uh, what I would say is starting with, you know, three things. First of all, a year ago, the world underestimated inflation. We talked about that last year. U.S. 10-year rates were close to 1.5%. We're now close to 420. 
um, I think that we'll probably see a peak of 4.5% 10 year rates. So, a combination of higher US rates, uh, higher oil prices, higher mortgage rates, I think you are going to see inflation in the US begin to come under control. Now, it will probably be a two year period, but you're going to begin to see that, I think, relatively quickly. And I think people are overestimating uh, the Federal Reserve's actions just as they underestimated it. The second point I would say is, you know, we're seeing very clearly across the world energy security is national security. We're seeing the issues that have gone on with the war in Ukraine. Um, we talked to Germany about this two years ago when we sanctioned Nord Stream 2 and not wanting them dependent uh, upon Russia. So I think just as the, the world wanted to get off of carbon, this transition is going to take longer. And there are sources of energy that have to be invested in uh, beyond just renewables. And then the third point I would say is clearly the geopolitical risk, forget the economic risk, is higher than we've seen in modern times. Um, I think that the, the U.S. relationship with China, we've obviously seen a big change internally with China. I think it's very important as the two largest economies, we have to figure out how to coexist and communicate, but clearly China is going to have a significant slowdown and that will have an impact on the world economy. And I, I think the world needs to come together on this situation in, in Ukraine and we need at least a temporary ceasefire if there's not a long-term solution. But whether it's the situation in Russia, whether it's the situation in China, or whether it's the regional issues here still with Iran, we need to deal with these issues and come together on them. You said at the beginning, and I'm paraphrasing here, don't, be, don't overstate what is coming. On the other hand, there are very significant and gloomy estimates of what could be coming down the track. How much do you think there's a danger of complacency? In other words, a willingness, an unwillingness to really understand that the stability we take for granted is unraveling. I think that existed a year ago. That definitely doesn't exist today. And, and if anything, people were way too slow to react because in hindsight, these risks were there, starting with Ukraine. Coming out of COVID, we had the largest fiscal and monetary response. It was obvious that the, the traditional models weren't going to work as it relates to the economy. So I, I think, you know, if you look at what UK has gone through recently, on their economic issues. Uh, we have great confidence in the new prime minister who was well trained as a finance minister, I might add. But uh, I think you're seeing everything is doom and gloom. And, and there will be issues. I don't want to underestimate the next six to 12 months, things are going to get worse before they get better. But I, I believe there's an end in sight so long as we can deal with some of these geopolitical risks. Can I put it to all three of you though? It's not about doom and gloom. It's actually about being realistic, and that's what good leadership is about. Um, what is your assessment of the ability of global leadership now to handle this, to think in different ways, picking up again what Governor Rumayan said, it's, it's about managing crises as opposed to being managed by the crises? Indeed, and I can tell you actually in contrast, um, Last year in April and October when the G20 finance ministers met and IMF and the World Bank, um, spring and annual meeting um, happened, um, you know, there was to a large extent some denial on some of the risks that we are seeing today. And I met with them just last week in Washington and things have changed. I think we are underestimating also our ability to adapt and then to deal very quickly with issues. Um, food crisis is one example. I mean, the world managed um, to control the food um, uh, crisis to a large extent compared to the last few months uh, through the deals that have been uh, brokered. Um, but still there are certain challenges. The debt challenge, G20 uh, and the Saudi presidency have agreed the common framework. We are working through it. It is difficult, but there is a lot more understanding now that we really need to accelerate it and institutionalize it. There is a more recognition now that the, the thinking about energy and renewables and climate change and trying to just imagine that transition is going to happen in one day have now become more realistic, that actually transition will take not only 
a year, not 10 years, possibly 30 years. So we need to invest in our energy security, but at the same time, not neglect the climate change. So generally, I'm not pessimistic. I can tell you whether it is in the region or even the world, it will be a tough time, but I think we will deal with it. And there is a lot of good signs that you could see in the multilateral institutions within the G20, but within the individual countries that we need to work better together. But let me pick up on what, what Steve was saying a moment ago, uh, and I put to him about complacency and so on, about the need to change mindsets. It's not about being negative or positive, but a bit about looking for solutions. Do you feel confident that in this six-month time period, nine-month time period, new ideas are going to come forward which are going to invigorate as opposed to just be in the business of putting Band-Aid on, on things which are just getting worse? The short answer is yes. Absolutely, yes. I think there is no other option but to find a solution. I think there are solutions in the ground that people are taking time to accept, and they will accept without going into details. Sheikh Salman, let me just pick up on that point if I can, because you and I are having a conversation, we, we go back several years, about what you did on COVID in Bahrain, and particularly what you described the war. Room. Are we at that stage where, and, and the impact of how that worked within government, um, and how it energized people to think in a different way. Is that the kind of thing that you think potentially should be used by many more governments? Because um, there was that, that, that suggestion yesterday from G Governor Rumayan that actually governments start with a certain ideology and then go backwards. In other words, you've got to start thinking in very different ways. Absolutely. Uh, so COVID at its uh, beginning, I remember having discussions early during the COVID crisis where we said within the team uh, and within the country that this is going to be a crisis where countries will be differentiated by leadership. And, the, and leadership was really the big differentiating factor when you look across different countries and their ability to deal with COVID. Uh, and it's extremely important to be able to be nimble, uh, to be able to plan well, and to be able to have the right execution capability. And that COVID model is a model that we have tried in the Kingdom of Bahrain across everything to do with government execution. You put in place a good, solid plan. You make sure that there's the right entities that need to be there. Everybody needs to be there around the table. They're given the resources that they need to be given, and they're supported with that execution. And when we look at the Gulf economies compared to the rest of the world, and we see that the picture for the GCC economies is a positive one at this stage today, even with the multitude of global challenges. Why is that? Because there have been very clear, well-articulated strategic development plans that are being executed consistently across the region, whether it's 2030 in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, 2030 in, in, in the Kingdom of Bahrain, the development plans that we see out of the United Arab Emirates and other places in the region. That is one of the big differentiating factors in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia this year and in Bahrain as well. The biggest driver of growth was non-oil growth in real terms. It was the non-oil sectors that were driving growth in the economies. And we're talking earlier about where the opportunities lie. Today, by and large, across the Gulf, if we, take, if we ignore the oil component of, of GDP, the majority of our non-oil GDP is, is, is economic activity built around cons consumption and imports. And the big opportunity is for us to transform those economies into economies that are based on production and exports for the non-oil sector. And as we move from consumption economies to production economies, we have a real opportunity set that we're going to be building a, a very strong economic. Can I put again that word I used to, to Steve a moment ago, complacency? What you discovered, surely, with your what you call a war room, is the ability to be agile, to be nimble. Absolutely. And we have to think back. You were warning this time last year about what was coming down the track. It's now being compounded by what happened on the 24th of February, which actually Putin had been warning about since 2007. Do you believe that within governments, government systems and corporate systems, there is that agility? Because you've all mentioned in a different way geopolitics in all of this. Yes, absolutely. That agility is there. And we are very lucky in, in our part of the world that we have young populations and with, with a very high quality human capital 
our greatest resource is our people. And you can see, and we saw it during COVID, you take somebody who is 25 to 30 years old, give them a massive responsibility, a massive challenge, and generally they will surprise you with the results consistently. And the speed at which they can do it. Absolutely. With no doubt. Do you feel that confident about systems to be able to handle the uncertainties coming? I, 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 un I unfortunately don't. I mean, I, I, I think in the region that may be the case. But look, COVID was really a great success story, the way the world came together. And, and clearly, I mean, you know, whatever doom and gloom there is now, you know, when, when I was sitting in the Oval Office and we shut down the U.S. economy and shut down plane travel, this was something we never experienced. And when we developed out-of-the-box tools like paying people for staying home, without the fiscal and monetary response, we would have had a global depression. And again, I think people underestimated when we came out of COVID the, the response, and that's what led to inflation and all these other problems. We need the same type of global response now to the geopolitical risks, because the economic risks and the geopolitical risks are tied together. So I think this, this can't be solved by just the U.S. alone. I think regionally, uh, the countries here are doing a good job. We've talked about, obviously, issues, whether it's in e Egypt or Lebanon or Jordan. Uh, you know, th there are economic issues in the region that need to be dealt with regionally. And I think on a global basis, uh, I hope that President Biden and President Xi get together. Because again, we need global leadership to deal with these global political issues. And when you see the statements, quite apart from we can call it doom and gloom, coming from the IMF World Bank two weeks ago, when you look at how they framed it, uh, the atmospherics, but also the statements which came, did you feel that there was inspiration there? Or did you sp feel it was a kind of replaying of a well-known playbook? I think it was a replaying of a, of a playbook of, you know, they underestimated things a year ago. And now they're looking at things and it's, they're, they're all the warning signs. And again, if, if I go back to doom and gloom, doom and gloom was COVID, shutting down the world economy and the True. costs of doing that, both from a economic and a health side, was extraordinary. And the world came out of that. And the challenges we have now are not nearly as big. Now, that's not to say that there aren't going to be economic hard times. I believe we have a recession in the US. I think it will continue. We'll come out of that. I think Europe is going to take a much longer time because of energy issues in Europe. And I think the decoupling of China from the world is going to have economic issues. But these issues can be confronted, and we can get through this. Let me put another issue on the agenda, the climate emergency. We had the Pakistan Prime Minister here yesterday, 33 million people affected. Now, in some ways, it's not unexpected, but the warnings from science are there. How much do you fear that that is something which is going to uh, have enormous implications for macro finance in terms of population stability, stability of societies, societies you have tornadoes, significant numbers, increasing numbers, hurricanes and so on in the United States. How much do you fear that something like that, in addition to COVID, which could come back, that in its own way, in addition to everything else that's happening, is going to become a significant challenge to macro finance? Obviously, climate change and the impact of climate change in the world is um, a very serious issue. Um, and it is not going to be resolved by one country's effort. It will need to be collaborative, and Steve have mentioned this. Without the world really cooperating um, and collaborating to deal with climate change, you are not going to resolve it. Um, I think the world is aware um, the world is trying to deal with this. Uh, the multilateral institutions are trying to support countries to deal with climate change impact. I can tell you in the region uh, where th really it is not known, uh, but we are making a lot of efforts to actually reduce emission, to deal with climate change, to invest in renewables. We are investing as much in, in conventional energy, but we are also investing uh, and climate change um, uh, initiatives, whether it is the green, uh, Saudi Green Initiative or the Middle East Green Initiative, but it will need to be a global cooperative effort because 
you know, climate change is a global issue. You cannot resolve it in one country. But what I'm, what I'm really getting at is the destabilization which is happening from climate. We all accept there's an emergency. We know what the IPCC has said. But it's now having serious impact. You had, you had the heat dome in America last year. We've had a heat dome in Europe this year. We've seen massive floods in Australia. Um, and you're, you're seeing enormous changes which are having impact on society, which in turn could therefore have impact on, uh, on economic activity. Uh, thank you, Nick. One of, one of the things that is extremely important in this debate, and we're having this discussion in Washington at the IMF and World Bank meetings, we have uh, COP27 coming up in Sharm el-Sheikh uh, next month, COP28 in the United Arab Emirates next year, and it's extremely important that during this time we start talking about what needs to change about financing the climate crisis, which is that we need to include the financing of fossil fuels as part of the mix. So today, the largest carbon issue you have is coming from the oil and gas sector. And yet, you cannot find the financing to put scrubbers on a refinery in Texas. Nobody will touch it. it does not make sense. If you have carbon coming out of a certain industry, you have to be able to provide the financing to, to, to clean up a big portions of that industry, and it is going to be the industry in which you will get the most carbon reduction per dollar deployed, and yet it is not being done, and that has to be brought in. And if you allow me just one thing around agile government that we were talking about earlier, there is already a model for agile government that we need to aspire to, and that is investment banking. You saw it in Goldman Sachs. I started my career at 21 years old at UBS Investment Bank and was given a lot more responsibility than a 21-year-old should have been given. And that's what we need to be looking at in government. We should be looking at and aspiring to the trading floors of investment banks and the level of responsibility that is thrust upon young people. And that's what we're doing every day in the Kingdom of Bahrain. What I'm trying to get to in these last four or five minutes is the fact that National security is not just about weapons and bombs. It's actually now about the stability of, of the communities and the impact and the fear that's now being generated. And that in its own way could have an impact on economic activity, Steve. Well, there's, there's no question national security starts with economic security. You need to have strong economies to create opportunities for people to also fund whatever type of military or other defensive capabilities one needs to. And as I mentioned, I think that energy security is also part of national security. And to your comment, you know, I believe that uh, over the next five years, we're going to see tremendous advances in carbon recapture technology. And we should be investing as much money in carbon recapture as we are in other forms of renewables. Absolutely. You know, the world came together in, in a COVID vaccine quicker than we ever thought. Uh, the the short-term solution to the climate is really around carbon recapture uh, as opposed to just energy transformation. But I, I think that this is obviously a global issue and needs to be dealt with. Right. We've got two minutes left. I need to get from each of you your, your warning, alert, encouragement for the next few months, what people need to go away from here this morning. Uh, you predicted inflation this time last year didn't get not quite as high as it is at the moment. But Minister, what's your, what's your view of the one thing that needs to be taken away from this gathering here? I think overall, the, the, you cannot look at the, the world uh, with the same lens. So you need to differentiate. Um, and I would say in this region, there is a lot of commitment to reform and that reform is continuing. And we have the resources to be able actually to deliver on the plans. Uh, but we need also to be watchful and we need to try and provide whatever support we can to our region while the world tries to stabilize itself. Sheikh Salman. Build resilience, be agile, because it's difficult to predict what the next six to nine months is going to look like. Does that mean constant self-questioning about what you're doing and how you're doing it? I wouldn't say question what you're doing, but I'd say constantly be ready to alter course, depending on the circumstances. Thank you. Steve Mnuchin. I'm going to give you two things. Uh, the first is I think people have to be careful because things are going to get worse before they get better economically, but we have to continue to invest because there will be great opportunities. And the second thing is I, I think on the geopolitical 
we can't take the status quo as given. I, I listen to smart people who say the war in Ukraine is going to go on another three or four years. That's unacceptable. We need to figure out how there's a global solution to at least get to a ceasefire on the hostilities. Thank you very much indeed. Don't take the status quo as given on many <laughs> issues. Thanks, all three of you, for sharing your thoughts uh, in this discussion about macrofinance. Ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you.